involved in that, uh, what, are, what is the good work that can be shared, and what, are the, what, what should we be trying to, to encourage and incentivize in this kind of work, whether it's in education or healthcare or community building or economics. There's a host of ways that the arts can play a role today that are becoming clear but perhaps are taken for granted. And these discussions among arts leaders of various kinds uh, are meant to, to open up the, the subject in a new way that will lead to progress. Uh, at the end of the day, though, some of it is literally about art itself. It's about making those connections. It's about collaborating. It's about finding uh, connections, creating relationships were discussed today uh, in, this, in these meetings which took place over here. Uh, and you're going to meet all the participants in a series of very rapid fire kind of power panel discussions that are going to go on. But first, I thought we'd start by sharing with you a little bit about how this day started. As Thor said, we began at Inner City Arts, this wonderful oasis of arts education about a mile and a half down the road from here. Uh, and we're privileged to have some of their, their leadership here in the house, so I want to say thank you uh, to Bob Bates and Beth Tischler and Dolores, all of you who hosted us on the two years ago, that was the video you just saw, uh, with Yo-Yo Ma and myself and some other musicians from the Silk Road Ensemble. And the principle of the thing was they had a concert the night before, right over here, and before they pulled out of town the next day, we went to Inner City Arts and we went to their classrooms and we watched what the teachers were doing, watched what the kids were doing, and we partook. We learned from them, hopefully we taught them some things, and we all came away richer for the experience, and it was simply there to be done. So we decided today that's how we'd start. So I'm going to show you now, there's a brief film uh, of what happened this morning, so you'll get a sense of that, and then you'll meet some of the artists uh, who were involved in this art strike at Inner City Arts. So but before we meet them, let's watch just a few minutes of the, what happened this morning. You guys are right on time and early. <laughs> All this music doesn't come from one place, it comes from a lot of different places and it gets mixed up here. So, kind of the instrument that I have comes from three different places. It comes from Puerto Rico, because it's tuned a little bit like a cuatro, because Puerto Rico, right, that's what we just played. It also comes from Cuba, it also comes from Mexico. And let's go into elbow circles now. If you need to take a step forward or backward. We have an actress, an actor, Alfre Wood. Nice. 
created. Look at people's commitment in their face and their expressions. Some people, I noticed, chose like with the scary music. Some people were the frightened person, and some people were were the sort of the scary person. And you do turns like that. Can you believe that? And then Charles worked with the dancers on what it meant to improvise, to listen to a piece of music and then to improvise. And similarly, in the music class, they had been working with Afro-Caribbean rhythms, so we added on to that. It was all meant to be a building process. And then, in, the, in really the message of working together, that the arts does better than anything, we collaborated on that piece, We Are Unique, which is a piece that we've developed and done in different cities where the children provide the lines, what makes them unique, and, and how. What about it? And then it gets set to the Gershwin prelude, uh, as you saw. So what we're going to do now is we're going to give you an actual taste of what the improvisation is. So I want to welcome uh, Midori and Charles Little Buck Riley, if you join us. And so you can actually see what the kids experience today. Uh, Little Buck is a dancer who lives here in LA, who was born in Memphis. And our first collaboration was actually at Inner City Arts. It was an arts education venture. And he met Midori this morning, as did I, officially. And uh, Midori needs no introduction. A citizen artist of the, just the ultimate class. From the beginning of her life as an artist, she was community-minded in how to participate. So we're honored to have you with us. So we're going to just show you this, which we basically made this morning.
an education about listening to something and responding. There's an education about the mixture of influences that can come into something. And that's what was trying to be uh, shared with the kids. And they went on, as you saw, the dancers themselves joined in. And that's really an essential part of all of this. It's about joining in. So the last thing we're going to share with you from this morning is that people do join in. So I want to ask uh, Midori and Danielle and Arthur Bloom uh, to join us uh, to do a piece of choreography where you will be the art, actually, just as the kids were. You're going to learn the beginning of George Balanchine, the great Russian-born choreographer, founder of the New York City Ballet, Serenade, with music by Tchaikovsky, and this is your band for the night, as it was for the fourth, fifth, first graders, kindergartners this morning. So I want you all to stand up, please. Because participating is what the arts do like nothing else. It's about singing a song, and it's about experiencing something yourselves. So I want you to imagine that the sun is shining. It's not 6.30. It's actually noon, and it's very bright. So you raise your right hand to shield your eyes from the sun. Very nice. That's right. There's a little angle on it, and there you are. But then the sun is so bright that you feel like you're getting a bit of a headache, so you slowly bring that hand to the side of your head. Right? Like, just like that. From there, you take that hand and you place it over your heart. And then the strangest thing happens. You start to become dancers right here in Disney Hall. You lower both hands to what we call first position. Now, I bet most of you know what first position is in ballet. So don't be frightened. When I say hands, you're going to open your feet to first position. Perfect. We're almost done. From there, you're going to open both arms on your right leg. And breathe. You close. And you prepare. That's Balanchine Serena. That's the beginning. So the next time you see that, you can say you've danced it. And now you're going to get to dance it with these incredible musicians. So, I think we should just do from the halfway point, like we did this morning. All right, so I'm going to say curtain. And when I say curtain, that means you assume your positions, all right? So here we go. Curtain, please. And. And you hold your position. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to take that away. I think we're going to do it. I'll do it. Thank you. So we wanted to do even more participation with you, but you know we're going to save it for another time. We wanted to do We Are Unique with you, but we don't, you know, we're going to save that for the next time. So what we're going to do now is while they set the stage, I'm just going to tell you that, you know, the ideas behind this really are about solutions, about how the arts provide solutions, whether in education, as we've already been talking about, or other sectors. And that's what this group represents. They represent artists working in different fields. They represent city and government officials who enable the work and promote it or choose what's going to happen. Uh, they represent arts organizations uh, of various kinds who can make that work part of their work. And why they do or why they don't is the subject of these discussions. So uh, we're going to lead off with a discussion about cities and community, uh, led by your very own Olga Garay. But before that, we have a short testimonial we'll show from one of the participants, and then they'll take the stage. What my dream for this work is, is that, um, that our culture moves towards a place where if you have a 
problem in your community, if you have an issue that needs addressed, if you have some roadblock, um, that your first thought is, we should call an artist. Um, that's, that's sort of the dream for me. That's what success looks like, is that, that we know where our artists are and we know how to depend and rely and call on them um, for the skills that they have. Terrific. Please, Olga.
and, and have somehow galvanized the great creative artistic talent among uh, varied gang members from all over the county of Los Angeles. Uh, we've had uh, recordings, you know, because that's sort of a, of great interest uh, to a lot of the homies who want to sing and rap and do all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, they were very much involved with the Cornerstone production of Cafe Vida uh, here in Los Angeles. So um, the, the hope, of course, is in the end to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it, that the idea is somehow to widen uh, the circle of compassion and to dismantle the barriers that exclude so that as we widen the circle and stand out at the margins with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless and the folks whose dignity has been denied and the folks whose burdens are more than they can bear, the hope is that uh, you widen the circle so that nobody is standing outside of it. And uh, I think in the end, that's the, the greatest hope and aspiration of art. Thank you, perfect. <laughs> That's why we asked him to serve on the panel. <laughs> um, on my left is Laura Zabel, who's here visiting us from the Twin Cities, and uh, that was her on the uh, Inner City Arts. I'm not, actually, that was taken here, right? Yeah, that, it was uh, just not so, um, so take it away. Sure. Uh, I am the executive director of an organization called Springboard for the Arts. Um, as Olga said, we're based in Minnesota, although increasingly we work um, in other communities as well. And our work is really about um, two things. Firstly, helping artists make a living and a life, and that looks like entrepreneurship and business skills training, those kinds of professional development resources, access to health care, uh, and then, uh, additionally, helping communities better tap into the resources that artists provide. So we really see that work through this lens of reciprocity. How do uh, artists exist as one part of what a community needs to be healthy? Um, and that work in community takes on a lot of different forms, and I thought I'd talk just really briefly about um, a couple specific projects, because I think you can hear me you know, talk economic development and community development all day, and that's not really that interesting, but if I talk about the actual work, that's the, that's the fun part. Um, so a lot of our work is about engaging artists around big community challenges and how artists can help mobilize and engage communities around challenges. Uh, so a project that we're working on right now is happening um, in, we're building a light rail in the Twin Cities. It's going right through the center of the city, through some of uh, the most um, disinvested and, and uh, diverse neighborhoods um, in the city, uh, and neighborhoods that have real historic reasons uh, to be worried about displacement, and businesses that are primarily um, small businesses, many immigrant-owned businesses, for whom living through four years of construction is incredibly challenging, even though, of course, the hope and the expectation of that kind of construction is that what comes along with it is connection and, and increased development in the end. Um, so we're doing these series of projects that uh, engage artists directly with small business owners and neighborhood organizations to address some of those challenges. Um, and sometimes those look very practical, like artists playing shows in uh, small restaurants along the corridor just to attract people and dollars there. Um, and sometimes they're really more about neighborhood identity and agency. So just two brief examples. Um, there's a restaurant uh, called the Black Dog Cafe, and and it's a small coffee shop and, and wine bar. And uh, for a while this winter, the construction had completely obscured their doorway. It was like they dug a moat around the business. Uh, you couldn't see their sign. You couldn't figure out how to get to the door. Um, and so they worked with uh, two puppeteers who built a giant two-person puppet of a black dog uh, that walks around the neighborhood. So if people can't see your sign, then maybe you take the sign to them. Uh, and I think it's a really good example of how artists sometimes just think differently about a challenge and see the, the opportunity and the challenge and the beauty and the chaos and, and then have these very practical skills. Um, and the other project that I want to talk about is a project uh, that was to sort of literally reanimate a vacant storefront on the corridor. So there's a lot of vacant space on the corridor right now. We drive past it all the time. You sort of get immune to, to this idea. Um, and so this artist um, did an evening uh, 
show where he projected, he, he made a projection and projected it onto the facade of this vacant theater and then had live dancers come and dance on the sidewalk alongside this projection. Um, and we, the audience, all sat on the half-constructed tracks. So you're sitting in the middle of this construction zone in the dirt watching this amazing performance happening on a sidewalk. And there are people leaning out of the windows above and people you know, driving their car over to the side to stop and watch. And I think that those are the kinds of things that change people's relationship to their neighborhood, to the place where they live. They change people's attachment and they, I think, change people's idea of what is possible in terms of their own personal agency and ability to change things and, and make things different um, in the place where they live. Thank you. you all made it down here. I love Los Angeles. Um, city made up of 95 neighborhoods, um, you know, every ethnicity, language, you know, kind of diversity you can think of. Um, and, um, you know, it just, it just makes our city a wonderful place to live in. It also makes our city a very challenging one to connect to. And our work at LA Commons is really all about trying to make those connections. We believe in people as the basic building blocks of the civic life of a city. And so our task is to really figure out ways and use story as that connector. Um, and recognizing that, you know, we all love stories and telling our stories and listening to stories and connecting it to each other through that vehicle. And what better way to tell those stories than through the arts? And so we, um, in many neighborhoods throughout Los Angeles, and I love my job because I get to go to all these neighborhoods, um, involve artists, um, both professional artists and amateur artists, most, mostly youth, to gather the stories of their neighborhood and then tell them in unique ways, like on murals, on light pole banners, and festivals, really animating the community and helping people to see themselves reflected in their neighborhood. But the challenge is, once you've done that in a neighborhood, how do you get other people to come and connect there? So we have a great tour program called Trekking LA, which is about taking people through the city, inviting them into neighborhoods to have experiences through the arts, through um, uh, food, mostly. How many of you like to go around and eat in Los Angeles? Um, and so, um, so through that, we're able to um, uh, entice Angelinos, which we all know how, how easy it is to entice us out of our little bubble neighborhoods, um, to come and connect to their neighbors in all of these wonderful neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Um, and I have to say, after 10 years of doing this work, it's really wonderful to hear young people talk about, you know, having thought of their neighborhoods as, you know, these places where gangs live and, um, you know, there's nothing there to do, to listening to their neighbors and their parents and everybody around talking about these wonderful stories that exist in every single neighborhood in the city. And really, when you think about cultural content, that's what it is. I mean, the stories of people are the content that make the arts rich. And so, um, you know, that is my greatest satisfaction, to hear young people talk about their city in a different ways and see a pathway for connecting and becoming leaders, the leaders that we so sorely need and the engaged citizens, how about that 10% turnout rate yesterday, uh, which we're working on, um, to, uh, we had an election yesterday, for those of you who don't, don't know, <laughs> um, to, um, you know, uh, really embrace their city and their fellow citizens. So thank you so much for listening. Um, we have two more groups that are going to come up, so in the interest of time, we're not going to
take any questions or answers, but um, it's always a struggle, but it's, it's only achievable if we work in unison, and that has been really the biggest lesson that we've taken, I think, from today's meeting. Thank you. True artists uh, understand that there is no separation from between their commitment to the people they produce art for to, to, to receive their art, to receive their story, to hear their music, or to marvel in their dance and feel inspired even physically by their dance. Uh, I don't think there's a separation there. I think that's natural. I think in terms of the notion of citizen artist, uh, one thing that I, I think is really important to think about is as practitioners, uh, arts practitioners, we have an aesthetic practice that we, we on an ongoing basis, uh, work on, develop, and, and, and commit to. And at the same time as committee engage artists, we have an engagement practice also that we equally have to work on and commit to and, and make an essential part of our overall work and practice. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, four individuals who are going to talk to you briefly about arts activism and arts communication. It was a major topic throughout the day today of how do artists do work in community and how do artists share that message uh, more broadly and then eventually hopefully take their work to a bigger and bigger community. I have four people who do that work in very different but um, very powerful ways and I'm pleased to introduce Shepard Ferry, visual artist, Yossi Serjano, who's a cultural producer, and uh, I should I should say Yossi and Shepard work together quite frequently and done some amazing things together. Uh, actor and activist Alfre Woodard and Michael John Garces, the artistic director of Cornerstone Theatre. tell you a little bit about what an arts activist is or what an arts activist can do. But I have a quote from each of them today during our, our um, round table this afternoon. I'm going to present them with their quote again and then hopefully um, they'll be able to explain that and also tell you a little bit about being an arts activist. Um, I'm going to actually start with Alfie if that's okay. Um, Alfie said today, I became an artist in a spiritual context. Um, we know Alfre's work from screen and television, um, and we may not think immediately of Alfre as a, as a spiritual artist, but boy, I'll tell you, when she talked today, she is a spiritual artist. And I'd like to have her tell you a little bit about what being a citizen artist is in that context. Um, I happened to be at a co-ed Catholic school, so I was ripe for, the, for having this occur to me, but it also was a time of man. It was uh, the late 60s, and we were trying to stop the war, I mean, which we are still trying to get equal rights, I mean, all those things were happening. They, sh they shot Bobby, they shot Malcolm, they shot Megger, so there was all these things happening, and I was introduced to film, and I was by a Christian brother sitting in the dark, you know, pissed off at first because we had to read the subtitles and you're 14 sitting there, but then being swept away by the story of a French father who could only see his little six-year-old girl on Sundays. And, you, and back then the screens were big and you watch like this. And I just realized all those things that we were connecting to the life of the prophet and, and, and wanting to correct in our own society. It was like, ta-da, this is, look, we can, we can harness this and do this. This is something. And so that whole thing of the connectedness between art, whether you were making up a song and singing it, whether you were moving across the floor, was that it was a healing thing. And you could not separate it. It was a spiritual thing. And we saw that, or I have learned as I've gone on, my work became freer and truer the less I took tried to control it and the more I understood that I, that I was a, um, I, I was allowing a creative principle to make itself present through me and so some of us all of us have the capacity but some of us surrender in, uh, more readily the way I don't surrender to numbers but I depend on somebody else that helps me through that so so to say that I just believe that you cannot if you you are making art. We do it sometimes individually and we can't get precious about it. We can't own it, which also means we can't freak out 
when, when it's suddenly like, I'm dry. It's like, no, you're not. If you're breathing, if they're, you know, so it, 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 it actually expands the possibilities. But we also, when we put that art out, when you make that statement, it is to land somewhere and you cannot separate yourself from where it lands. So I think artists and activists are part of the same thing. Um, Alfie recently adopted a school in New Orleans, right? And um, I'm hoping you'll just say a, a word about what that work is, because you spent some time in that school, right? Yes, it's the, the Batiste Cultural Academy. Louisiana is last in the states in education, and the Batiste Academy is last in Louisiana. So you could say it's the, the lowest performing school in the country. But Damien and I work with the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities. We have a turnaround arts program. And just by taking art into these schools, within even, we noticed within six months the culture of the school turns around it's not when we seek funding whether it's private funding or governmental people think that art is frivolous it's a luxury but art is as important as those hot lunches that you give it's as important as making sure that everybody's vaccinated they got enough blood running through them and so by doing this work in those schools we see that we are not it's fabulous that there are some artists that come out of it but we're not breeding artists what we're doing is is really supporting the well-being of human beings, individuals, and that changes communities, that changes cities, and that's what we're supposed to be doing anyway, living. And that's the spiritual context of Alfie Wood. turn to Shepard, who of course has a vast body of work, but um, many people first know him by his most iconic work, or a work that we all recognize, and he said today something that fits very much with that, which I want to repeat back to him. The power of art is its ability to create a common message point. What does that mean, Shepard? I think that... Is this working? Thank you, Yossi. Uh, he's helped me out a lot <laughs> over the years. Um, I think that... that uh, a lot of times people feel alone in, um, in their view of the world and their, you know, a, a, an emotion they feel about a situation. Sometimes, uh, am, I, am I the crazy one? Look at what's going on around us. And um, art can really crystallize something that, that, you know, that's in the air, but people need a reference point to say, yes, I believe in that. Yes, I agree with that. Or, you know, I, I, I have my additional thoughts. Um, but it's, it, it becomes part of, of language and communication that, um, that really I think affects people emotionally and intellectually uh, in, a, in a way that's different from an editorial in a newspaper or uh, or in any other form of communication. I think if it, if it affects someone emotionally, then it can get beyond predisposition and make people ponder something and talk about something that they might not normally. So that's the power of, of art, and I, I you know um, I've used art to both. Uh, solve problems for myself, personal therapy, but whenever I see my own problems, I usually can see them relating to larger problems in the world, and if I can find a way to address that through my, through my work, both in a way that, that's, that's helpful to me, but I think can find uh, use in, you know, in, with, a, with a larger audience, that's something I'm always trying to do. And sometimes it's about very, um, very topical things, sometimes it's about um, you know, it's about things that I think are more timeless, but, um, but you know, con communicating and connecting with people um, is, is really why I create, why I create art, and it's, um, it's incredible that it's one of the few areas where I think one can escape and engage simultaneously, and to me, um, I, I, I feel a real uh, obligation to use, use the skill set I have as an artist to, um, to be an activist at the same time. Amazing. Uh, yeah. I want to turn to Yossi. Uh, and first of all, Yossi, you might say a word or two about um, what you do, and then uh, address this statement. Creativity is our chief export. Hmm. I can't remember saying that. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the, the, the first question, um, and that is, Artists have this unique ability to take really complex, really sophisticated problems and to distill them down to the most powerful, simple, emotive songs 
images, visuals. They can take problems that we're all facing, that we're not all feeling, um, and we trust them, and we entrust them with um, the ability to push, push us to think about the world in a different way. I believe that the artist activist is somebody who brings intention to the practice, and that the practice itself and the product itself is, bears that intention. Um, so that's my definition of, of, of activist. California, uh, for those, of, um, hopefully a lot of you know, and if you don't know, please sign up for, um, I think I saw Danielle in here, please sign up for um, Arts for LA, I think .org. Um, please um, get involved, learn these numbers, but um, I believe it's uh, one out of every eight jobs in the state of California is directly attached to the creative industry. Um, one out of it, for every dollar invested in the arts, eight is produced, right? These numbers are, are, are um, very real, very researched, right? Um, we, just in this room, the people that are employed in this room, um, are deeply invested in the success of the creative future of our state. Um, this state sends out to the world um, a projection of who we are, what we believe in, and the artists in their community is doing exactly the same thing. They're projecting into their community what they believe in, what they stand for, and hopefully challenging people to, to challenge those ideas back. Um, to receive that information, to process it, and to have a conversation around it. I believe in the power of that art as a transformative um, vehicle, and I believe that um, we should be encouraging, training artists, empowering artists, creating infrastructure for those artists to convene those conversations on their own. Fantastic. which does terrific work in communities uh, by bringing communities and theater professionals together. And um, something that he said today is, uh, this work requires us to build collaborative relationships, sometimes beyond our own field. Tell us a little bit about how you do that at Cornerstone. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I love LA too. Um, and uh, Cornerstone's been in LA for about 20 years now, creating work in collaboration with uh, people from all walks of life, uh, non-professionals, uh, working side by side to create a performance that's reflective of their community. So by, for, and about the community with, with, uh, with whom we're in collaboration. Um, when I think about this notion of artist activist, uh, and, and you asked us to define that term for ourselves, you know, I. I I just look at the word activist. I mean, I think artist activists are artists who seek to activate people through their practice. Um, and I think the goal often of entertainment is to do the opposite. And I'm a big fan of entertainment. You know, when I see Star Wars, I'm not activated. It kind of, it kind of puts me to rest. It allows me to rest, and that's great. But that's not artist activism. Artist activism is, is, is I think, is in its intent is to make you either think about yourself and evaluate critically your own lives or goals or practices, or to look at your community or your society critically and seek to change that, whether it's, it's in service of a campaign and has sort of short term, like we're trying to get out the vote kind of thing, or long term changing uh, ideas and changing minds about our society. And uh, in terms of collaboration, um, you know, uh, I've been with Cornerstone for seven years and it's been an education in, in collaboration. And we've collaborated with major corporations, we've collaborated with uh, farmers, we've collaborated with day laborers, we've collaborated uh, uh, with uh, uh, home, Homeboy Industries and, and a wide range of neighborhoods across Los Angeles and, and communities across the uh, uh, state. And learning about collaboration has been the, the, the big lesson for me. Uh, you know, it's easy to think of, you know, I'm in theater, I think, you know, we all as artists think of ourselves as collaborators, but a lot of time what we're doing is we're walking in the room and I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to manipulate you into doing what I think I want us to do. And that's actually not a collaboration, that's me trying to figure out, either telling you what to do or trying to figure out how to get you to do what I want. A real collaboration is getting into a room with a group of people, or one other person or more than one other person, and saying, let's figure out where we want to go and how we're going to get there, and not know what the answer is going to be, and not know what the end result's going to be. And that's a tremendously risky and tremendously exciting process that I think truly activates people and truly uh, uh, opens the door to, to exciting and, 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 and unexpected art. And uh, that's what I hope to do every time I go out now. We're going to pass it off to the next group in a minute, but I just want to add one last quote that I can't remember who said today, but it was a great one, which is, in arts activism, sometimes the process is the product itself. Sometimes the doing is more important than what is done. And I think that was a great outcome, a great um, comment. Who said that? Does anyone want to take Yossi? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> we all have opportunities to engage ourselves in the communities that we live. Um, and I think that um, as musicians, as artists, um, one should not forget that we are person first, we're citizens first. Being in the hospital uh, is a very isolating thing to happen on top of everything else. So the outside world has to come to you. Uh, and, and here, a musician uh, has this in incredible uh, ability to help this severely injured service member uh, not just learn to play music, but in many ways recover their lives. So we're going to come back now to music. And you know, we're going to we have an incredible array of, of different interests in music, if you will, that we'll, we'll go through quickly in the form of the questions. But I think that I want you to, I want to answer Father Boyle's question, why he was here. In so many different ways, citizen artistry is not simply about artists, it's about citizenship. It's about how citizens interact with arts. And that includes all of you who chose to come here tonight. And there's, there's uh, an obligation to that of a sort. There's a charge to it. And it's the idea of how do we value, what do we value in society? And that is something that the arts and artists are wrestling with, as we've been discussing, about how we interact. Whether we just chose to just become, as it could be, a ballad dancer, and that's all I was going to do, or is there going to be more to it? Are we going to be a musician, that's all there going to be? Or what is there? So I want to start um, with this incredible group of people who participated over the course of this day. And I want to ask Midori uh, specifically, and then Anne, about what it is that, you know, citizen artist activities and musician activities that, that you've been involved in and created, and, and, and how this happened, and how you were passing it along, in, in a sense. How is it becoming, you know, vital in your world? Um, I've been involved formally in music education and community engagement work for the last 20 years. And um, I got into it very naturally. Um, I would say that uh, because of my family background, um, the influences that I had from my family, um, it was just so um, natural for me to start doing this through music, which was my area. Um, and. Um, as I was working in the New York City schools first, um, and then um, afterwards also in Japan, and then also in developing countries, um, I realized more and more that um, I wanted to share the experience that I was gaining about how to engage the community um, with younger musicians and um, helping them really come to an understanding of how best to successfully um, approach this kind of activity. Um, um, when a young person can experience success, um, I think this is one of the best ways to get them further involved in more activity in the same way. So um, I wanted to get more and more actively involved in the teaching of the community engagement um, um, activities. And so now as a, a teacher, it's a very natural part. Um, of my teaching also to involve my students in learning about um, community engagement and also really, you know, when I ask the question myself about how do we learn in life, how do we teach in life, um, through many different ways, but um, it's very important that um, artists can role model for the younger artists how this is done. Um, sometimes it's also by way of giving them some kind of an incentive. Um, and so many, many different ways of getting the younger artists involved. Um, this has become a very, very important part of our field. Um, I do believe that um, educating the younger musicians um, in the way of community engagement is as important as as other subjects that they're getting in conservatories and in music schools as they're trained in chamber music, in orchestra, in solo, all these um, performance training that they get. They also need to get performance um, experience, performance um, education in community engagement activities. So to, 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 to make sure we all understand this, so to work with you, it's part of the work, that's it. 
if you have a student, are they involved in community engagement? Um, for the work I do uh, with my students at USC, yes, this is part of their syllabus. That is. And if they don't do it, then they don't make the grade. Dan <laughs> um, Parsons, the Detroit Symphony before that. Executive Director of New York City Ballet, where I was a dancer, Hollywood Bowl before that. We have many connections. Did you know I graduated at Hollywood Bowl from Hollywood High School? Yes, I'm home. Uh, and how does that manifest itself in an arts organization? The way that Midori talks, she's talking about actually from an artist to young artists, which is the passing on that is from time immemorial, but now into this brew is this, if you want to make the grade, you're going to be a part of this work. How does that manifest itself as an organization now? So um, today there were uh, many uh, thoughts and conversations around some of the barriers to this work. It's not all roses and, and simple, and um, we just all join arms and go out and do it. Um, institutions have a lot of rules, and um, people have a lot of uh, perceptions. Sometimes um, I think it's baggage that they carry around with them about high art and whether high art actually can live side by side with this organic process of community arts and engagement. And of course, um, everyone who is involved in this has um, believes that this is one and the same. It's an organic process. And I think you all also know, know that the, the traditional way of consuming arts, um, this, is a, this is one of the great buildings where art takes place. And you have a lot of uh, people who are coming here in large groups to this beautiful concert hall. But place making art, and in large quantities, thousands of people coming together to hear art and to observe art, um, is less and less popular, even though music and the arts are more and more popular. And so institutions are grappling with this very complex tension between the need for art and the, 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 the need to consume and participate in art and the um, access to art. So the, the complication for those of us who run institutions is uh, it's not as easy as being a teacher and simply saying you're not going to make the grade if you don't do this work. Uh, so legislating participation in this doesn't work. You, you really can't make artists do this. They have to want to do it. And so um, we struggled in Detroit. We've struggled with so many things there, but we're very proud of our arts, and our arts are very vital, and our artists are fabulous. And so um, we uh, did have to change some of our rules. Um, through negotiations, but once the rules were changed, there was the freedom for artists to select this opportunity to engage in communities, and now we have artists choosing to, uh, musicians in the Detroit Symphony choosing to be in hospitals with sick children, to be in schools, to be in assisted living homes with our seniors who can't get out, and they are uh, becoming so rewarded by this work it's optional, and it is catching like wildfire. The first year, four or five people were doing it. The next year, 20 people were doing it. The third year, 50 to 60 people will be doing it. And, and so it, is, it becomes a movement, as we've talked about. Um, it is better if it comes from the inside out. Uh, for the artists themselves, and institutions have to figure out how to create the environment in which this is not only able to take place, but it is rewarded, it is lauded, and it is um, natural. That's incentivized from both sides. That's a natural segue back to, to an individual. Arthur Bloom, who you saw on the video, uh, is a pianist. You heard him play earlier. And he created something called Music Corps, which does work at Walter Reed. Uh, and uh, you know, what you described, Anne, just now was an activation of a sort, is an activation of the artists. How the artists themselves can come alive in some way that perhaps they didn't see coming, because it's not like you have 50 or 60 new players. It's that it's players who before perhaps were not signing up, didn't find it something they wanted to do, are realizing, wow, this does something for me. This is something important. Uh, and I'm a big believer in the fact that it actually makes better artists to participate in these things. I've seen it many times. But Arthur, I want to ask you about activating through your work. When you activate on the receiver side as opposed to the giver, tell me about that, what, what that does at Walter Reed. Well, 
every day that I'm there, I see what it does. It's impossible to really fully express it. You have to go there and see it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, every day that I come home, I could come home with an anecdote. Um, the other day, I got a text from a soldier that he apologized for missing a piano lesson um, because he had a finger amputated that day. Um, could we make it up as soon as possible in another couple of days? And he was so sorry. The idea that he is apologizing for having, you know, he was injured by a roadside bomb, and this is one of what could be 50 or 60 surgeries. But it turns out that if you bring musicians in and you bring music in, that that for many of them becomes the most important thing that they do to help them get back to us. So, that, so what, what it described, I know you told me one story about, uh, about Will, who I met when I visited with you. Right, so here's this one soldier. Uh, he was blown up shortly after he turned 18. Um, he's a Walter Reed, and when I first got there, um, I didn't think we would work with him. Uh, he just wasn't really talking very much. He was, he was, he was a mess. Uh, physically, he was in bad shape. Um, many of the folks who work with have amputations. He had, he'd lost a leg, and the other was hanging by a thread. And um, I didn't think we'd work with him. He wasn't talking. He wasn't making eye contact. <laughs> in any case, one day, he uh, picked up a guitar, because we were going to the Fisher House, or we, we were operating at that point, and he started uh, working with a guitar guy that we had there. It was either go to a barbecue or play guitar, and he, he, he picked it up. And he literally never put it down. He started bringing it to his physical therapy, bringing it around Walter Reed with him, and it very quickly became what he did at Walter Reed. He would wake up, he would play guitar, and then he would go to sleep. He started watching videos of Wilhelm Kempf playing Beethoven sonatas on YouTube at night and became, having had no classical music exposure, uh, this Beethoven aficionado and had to play Beethoven on the piano. So he started learning Beethoven. And uh, you're talking about someone spending 15, 16 hours a day doing music. He woke up, he started talking, his sense of humor came back, um, just everything, um, just sort of remarkable. I remember actually you know, getting a text, uh, me and Matt are uh, arguing who is better. He says, Paul McCartney, I say Mozart, need your, need your advice. Uh, you know, this, is, this is what's on his mind, this is what he does. And uh, you know, it's, uh, just, it's just remarkable, so. I, I got to visit um, with them uh, in, in December um, on, the, on one of the earlier films you saw Yo-Yo Ma playing there. We went to visit and just literally to play. And the, the, the advice that, that Arthur gave us before was that this is not kumbaya. This is not a nice thing. They want to play, actually. They want to practice. They want it to be difficult. That's, that's the deal. That's what we want to do. And that's what happened. They went and played. Um, Arthur made some arrangements of uh, various songs for Yoyo to play, and they were just, they couldn't wait for him to get there so they could play with him. And that was the point. That was, it was not about uh, what someone might imagine as a feel good, we're going to feel better now. It was actually, it was the work itself, which I think is a lesson in all of this, that it is work. For the kids this morning, they were working hard, and that's what they got out of it. It wasn't just, you know, we're going to have fun and it's going to be really great. It was that, oh, we're going to have to think and we're going to have to maybe perform and we're going to have to examine and participate, uh, which is, you know, a big part of all arts education, but it's something that gets lost in the idea that maybe it's frivolous, which was mentioned earlier. It's work. It's actually work. Um, I want to turn to Gretchen now. Um, and Yola, which is, you know, this is the house of Yola, has been, you know, a tremendous success. And, you know, El Sistema out of Venezuela well, it has been much copied, uh, and people have tried to do it, but I think that there's no denying that this is the success story in so many different ways. So I wanted to ask you if you could share with us a little bit about what made it so. What, what, what are the, the lessons that you've learned as far as from the artist's point of view and also the organization in terms of how this is being spread successfully? Yeah. Um, I, Gustavo has said that orchestra is the greatest metaphor for community. And 
And um, when I think about success and Yola, it really, it really does come down to community. We're, what we're doing is um, creating a program that's that is actually building citizen musicians. So before they would even get to someone like Midori, we're taking five-year-olds and turning them into citizen citizen musicians. Um, it's first a social program. It's next a music program. But that that doesn't mean that the the level of excellence or artistry is low. It actually means that it's very very high and rigorous. Um, because as we trust in children more and set really high expectations, the social benefits will rise alongside that. Things like you know, self-confidence and self-worth, um, their understanding of their responsibility in a group, um, and what it really means to be in a community. Um, at this point, we have uh, about 550 students um, in two different sites in South LA and the Rampart District. They're with us five days a week for up to about 15 hours a week. So it's, it's a very intensive program. Um, and it's not rocket science. Being together a lot builds capacity and it builds community. Um, and you see it also from the teaching artist or LA Philharmonic perspective, the people who are working with these kids day in and day out. For them, what they're doing is turning their traditional music education um, experiences upside down and they're realizing that they're building this utopia that they've always kind of longed for. They're finding a new community for themselves in Yola and I've heard from many of our teaching artists and LA film musicians that this has become um, something that they expect to be a part of their lives forever. From an organizational point of view, um, what, what I find really interesting is that the LA Phil has a, a very important artistic imperative. It also has a social imperative, and, and Yola has become this incredibly beautiful embodiment of that social imperative for the LA Phil. And it, it hit me the other day when I was hearing some, some of our students talking about what they like about the program. Somebody was interviewing them and they were saying things like, well, I, I come here because I have friends. I have people who really understand me. Um, I really like playing Mahler and Tchaikovsky and Beethoven. Um, and then you hear Deborah Borda, CEO of the LA Phil, talking about Yola. In, in different vocabulary, but in a very, very similar way. And to me, that, that means that one of the things we talked about today with citizen artists is, is this idea of, I think, Laura, you said it, reciprocity, right? This, the, the, what the artist is offering, the participant, participant is offering the artist, that there's a real exchange there. So as, as much as the LA Phil has, with its partner organizations in Yola, changed communities, Yola has equally changed the LA Phil. Interesting. I think that that idea of reciprocity is one that runs through this, and it, it's something that we talked about today, and it's come up in other gatherings that we've had, which the idea is that the arts quite steadily over the last years have come to be perceived in some ways as needy. It's not, it's not a secret. There's about how do we get the funding? How can you, how can, how can you help us? And what this actually, it does, it flips it on its head. It's about how are we helping each other? What is that reciprocity? What is that handshake that can go on as opposed to a needy relationship, which is ultimately damaging to the field and also doesn't reflect the true worth of what the field can do? Uh, we have one distinguished guest from abroad with us, Armand Diendenda here, founded and is the conductor of the Kinshasa Symphony. And this is a remarkable achievement on a thousand different levels. But he, he, at the end of the session today, uh, I asked him what he thought really was listening to all of us, wrestling with how to make a difference in different ways. And he had an interesting response, which was that he worried that we were losing our passion for music. That maybe this somehow didn't connect with the original intention, and that was dangerous. Does that, does that reflect, you think, Armand, what, uh, what you meant to say? Ce que je voudrais dire avant tout, c'est que la passion constitue le moteur de ce que j'ai fait depuis 18 ans. But all I wanted to say in the beginning was the passion of music is what uh, motivated me to do music 18 years ago. That's what I have felt and that's what I continue to feel. Et tous ces jeunes musiciens qui sont également avec moi, se sont rapprochés de moi par la passion qu'ils ont. 
and all the young uh, guys that came joined me in this movement, they felt the same passion of doing music. So we all have the same passion of doing music. Et ce que nous faisons également reflète beaucoup d'amour auprès des gens, et surtout une ouverture d'esprit pour euh, pas mal de gens. Et également, ça permet aux gens de se rapprocher les uns les autres. And what we do uh, reflect our passion towards the community, towards people, and uh, that really became an instrument to putting us together, and then everybody feels like close to one another. Et aujourd'hui, ce qui me fait un peu peur, je ne voudrais pas voir cette passion avec euh, une certaine ouverture qui s'est faite à travers le monde, que les gens puissent perdre cette passion-là. And I'm afraid nowadays that what really uh, we have inside of us, the passion of music, with, it, with nowadays development, I'm afraid that people, especially artists, begin to lose that passion that in the first place moved them to do music. Parce que si cette passion est perdue, c'est également l'avenir qui est compromis. Because I feel if that passion is lost, which means the future is compromised. So the challenge was out to us. Did we lose, did we lose our way in, in trying to address how the arts can do other things? Is, are they, is, is that what, what, what's happened here? And we had a, a bunch of reactions, but I wanted to ask Kiff, who's the founder of Musician Corps and has worked on many uh, citizen initiatives, including AmeriCorps early in his career, uh, which uh, I'll just let you answer from your point of view what you, what you felt or uh, reflected. Yeah, I was, um, we use a lot of language to describe, new kinds of language to describe our work with Musician Corps um, around social impact and, and, and music interventions and um, social artist entrepreneurs and we've kind of, uh, music public service, sort of had to come up with a whole lot of things but when I heard um, this talk about passion, I sort of wanted to rewrite our mission statement and say, hey, our mission is to unlock passion, the passion for music that's in society, that's in the heart and soul of every person in this room. And um, I realize that a lot of the work that we've done, and hearing that story about Will is very similar to some of the stories that we have. You know, a lot of people you know, feel trapped and, and the arts and creativity is a channel, it's a vehicle for us to process whatever's going on inside and get it out. And um, we certainly find that, you know, for kids in hospitals, um, for whatever reason, whatever, the, whatever reason they're there, um, when we go in and we do that work and we heard about it uh, on this panel, um, the metric that we use for success is the parents telling us whether or not the kids feel more in control and more empowered after the work. And it's in the high 90% that every time they feel more control in an environment where they have no control. The same is true in veterans hospitals. There was one veteran and we work with senior veterans, so they're dealing with end of life issues and one of them said, I never thought something beautiful would happen to me here, but this drumming has made something beautiful and I've been so lonely. So one of the challenges that we discussed today around citizen artistry is how do you measure it? How do you count it? How do you sell it to funders and foundations? And whether it's a smile, whether it's a sense of empowerment, whether it's the diminishment of loneliness, um, whether it's, we're, let's say one more thing, and, and that's that I love always asking people if, uh, if when they say, God, that sounds so cool, that's such a great idea, da, da, da. Um, and I'll say, well, yeah, what is music role is, what his role has music played in your life? And this just happened at a party this weekend. And this was a tech person. I live up in San Francisco. And I had no idea that she was into music. And she said, you know, because you were just talking about it being hard work, Damien. She said, I learned that hard work pays off. That was one of the coolest sound bites I had ever heard. That I didn't become a musician, but because we worked really hard and did that performance, I realized when I did that first performance. And so that it paid off, that all that hard work was towards something. So the passion, the engagement, the bringing people together, um, 
thought it was all embodied in, in what we heard today. Since I'm the last guy talking, I want to thank you, Damien, and also thank you, Thor, and Music Center. I'm sure there'll be a wrap up, but there's so many other people, as you said earlier, that need to be brought into this, that have been doing this work for years. I can think of many, there's some in this room. Um, so it's been an honor to be here and be a part of this. So thanks for your work. It's an thank you, thank you. It's an important point. This is not new work, as you all know. This is not new work. Citizen Art is, is not new work. This has been going on, frankly, since time immemorial. Um, there's, there's a certain duty to it as an artist in some essential way. But what we're recognizing with this convening is the fact that in today's world, there's a particular need, if you will, that can be fulfilled by the arts, whether it's, as, as Alfred was talking about, with turnaround arts, where these schools that need help in turning themselves around, the arts can play a particular role. Or in a veterans hospital, the arts can play a very particular role. And it's a matter of finding ways to incentivize this work and to revalue it, if you will. And I think that Armand's point really brought us up short for a second because we thought, what is our passion? Is our passion for our art form diminished by putting it to use in some way? And I think that the answer came back resoundingly, no, it isn't. It's actually enhanced. I and mean, if you think about what Midori said, you can realize as a student, it adds to your quiver of, of, of passion. It's more, not less. And it's how it can help. But that goes into the revaluing. And that's where you all come in in so many different ways. We talked a lot in our meetings today about perception, whether on the art side, the arts organization side, the artists themselves, or the public, which have to realize what the value of the arts is in order for it to be placed in its appropriate sense. And this isn't a traditional idea of like the arts are important because an arts and the value for art's sake. I'm thinking more in terms of that what the arts actually, how they fit into our lives, whether it's as the, the quote that, that Thor said about it, our chief cultural export, or those things that we just discussed about healthcare and how we can make that, why aren't arts therapies insurable? Are they insurable in some cases? Shouldn't they be insurable in all cases? Well, that's a value question. Are they valuable? And that's where perception comes in across the board. Education is, of course, a primary example when you're faced with ideas about how to measure success. How do we measure success today in the arts? And I think we're standing in a place that has redefined measurement of success in the arts. It's not enough in so many ways to say it's a brilliant orchestra with a magnificent maestro. It's also a social value organization creating enormous impact in the lives of its community, which in the classical arts increasingly are a call to arms. It must happen, otherwise, you know, we can talk to Anne further about that. In a city like Detroit, if you're not relating to your community, what are you doing? Are you, are you gonna live? It becomes an existential question. But that's the point here for this kind of convening that's going to go on, and I hope we're going to be doing one in Detroit coming up and addressing some of the particular issues to communities as we address some of the particular issues here in Los Angeles. So as you leave here tonight, I want you to think about the mechanisms that are involved in making this kind of work valuable, and how can it be incentivized, and what are the, the ways to actually encourage, if you believe what you heard tonight, if you would believe what the Father Boyle said about the influence on the gang relations that, that graphic arts can have, or the influence uh, in a hospital room, or certainly in a classroom as you saw in inner city arts, what are the ways to make this happen? So I want to thank you all for joining us, and I want to thank the Music Center and Thor for being our partner and host in this, and all the artists and participants and arts organizations that have helped to make this happen. And your beautiful performances tonight, Danielle and Charles, Little Buck Riley and Midori and Arthur for, for sharing the, the passion of actual getting to see something happen. But mostly I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to you for listening and uh, hopefully engaging with this idea of citizen artists as an idea for the 21st century. Okay, and thank you all for being on this.